you are likely neighbors with a Muslim. Let's break down these barriers and open some doors and, and speak to each other. I'm a, I'm a huge extrovert, so I'm always like, you know, hey, we moved <laughs> in, you wanna want some cookies? You know, let's have a conversation. My name is Ansa Achea, and I'm an American citizen of Ghanaian descent. I'm also an actor, an artist, director, and educator. I'm taking a trip across the state to meet our neighbors, learn what brings us together as Minnesotans, and celebrate the ways in which our distinct cultures lay the foundation for healthy living. In this video, I'm meeting with members of the Somali community. Minnesota is home to the largest Somali community in North America, possibly in the world, outside of East Africa. Somalis have been in the United States since the early 1800s, but in 1991, civil war broke out in Somalia and thousands fled to Minnesota as part of the refugee resettlement program. Thank you so much for meeting with us today. We're in the Somali Museum in Minneapolis, literally on Lake Street. I've never been here before. Being here it just reminds me of home. The artifacts here are old artifacts that I might not really know or never used. Uh, but I know that this is what my grandparents and great grandparents used. I'm really curious about this structure, this hut. Is it what it's called? Yes, uh, it's yeah. called, uh, I think, a mudul. If, if we were talking about my great-grandparents, for example, this is probably what their homes look like. I'm, I'm following the expert. Shall we yeah, check it out? Yeah, all right, all right? Let's, let's do it. Wow. Yeah, this is, this is the room. <laughs> this is the room. <laughs> this is actually bigger yeah. inside than the, is, the way it, it feels outside. So Somalis are pastoral. Uh, societies. So that means they move around a lot uh, based on where the water is and mm -hmm. where the green pasture is. So they would build something like this, they stay here for a few months, and then next month they have to move somewhere mm -hmm. else. Almost all Somalis are Muslims. We say that you know, what makes us Somalis Somalis is also partly um, religion. Muslims are those who follow Islamic tradition. To learn more about the Islamic tradition in the Somali community, Malaika Dahir invited me to visit her mosque in North Minneapolis. Malaika is the executive director of RISE, reviving the Islamic Sisterhood for Empowerment, an organization committed to amplifying the voice and power of Muslim women. I identify as a black Muslim woman from Somalia, but I do have sisters and brothers who would identify as just Somali. I grew up on the feet of my mom and my grandmother, and I've always seen strong black Muslim women in my life. One of the most important things is to realize that just because somebody doesn't wear a hijab, which is the traditional head covering, that they're not Muslim. So it's important to ask to confirm because a hijab is a choice. A lot of us choose to wear it, and a lot of us choose not to wear it. Muslims pray five times a day here. The reason we took off our shoes is because we prostrate. The, one of the positions of prayer is prostrating our heads to the ground. So this building is, is a hub for the community. We they have a community kitchen here where they're feeding tens of thousands of people a day through the Meals on Wheels kind of program. The mosque had a vaccination clinic in the parking lot. Oh, wow. Right, so if you have an imam that looks like you, who practices like you, leading by example and telling you to do this, there were a lot of people who, who got their vaccinations as a result of, of this. Somalis are now leading industries and systems across the region, including education. What does the name of the school mean? Acacia, where, does that, where did that come from? It comes from, uh, from the acacia tree. So it's a kind of symbolic tree in Somalia. The elders of, 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 a, of a village, they meet under that big tree, that acacia tree. It's like uh, the, the city council, uh, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, that, that's where they do their the affairs. And that's the close community. I mean, everybody wants to uh, be part, part of a community that is uh, uh, strong and, and, and together and helping each other and, and supporting each other. And that's what we are trying to be part of. What has it been like working with Somali kids in particular in a Montessori school? 
people come, they want to see some, someone like them. I mean, they want to see my wife with, uh, with the hijab. It's also teaching more about, about our culture and, and uh, talking sometimes to, uh, in, in our own language with them. That helps a lot, yeah. I mean, they came here as, as, as a refugee, so they, they, they really want to have a better life. This is a new life, new chances, and, and, and they want to make the best out of it. In spite of all this progress, Somali Minnesotans still struggle to navigate the healthcare system. People don't feel that they are heard, that their needs are being addressed or met. Are you okay with me touching? Do you need a third person in the room if you're a male? If your patient is female, to, you know, to ensure that she's comfortable. Do they need an interpreter? A couple of years ago, my father was hospitalized. It was very serious. My dad is very strong, healthy. That was the first time that he was hospitalized. But just because he's 80 years old and he's you know, a black person, the doctors felt like, oh, this person is ready to, to go. And I remember that conversation, and, and those conversations was made before they even saw him. It was like, OK, this is what this says, and this is what we want to do. We just felt like we had to fight. A month later, our dad walked out of that hospital on his feet, and he's now at home. This person may be a bit different than the book that you read about them. Mm -hmm. So having a personal conversation, building a personal relationship with that person. What are some of the things that healthcare providers could be educated about when they're dealing with Muslim patients? Pork is forbidden um, in any form. So when prescribing, you know, things like medications or supplements, a lot of the times the coating in capsules are, are coated in gelatin to ensure that, you know, it's vegan or bovine. Some shots, you know, may, may have that. When I had my first child, I was, I was actually quite shocked to find that some powdered formula had pork products. And luckily, I had a Muslim provider who was able to, to stir me and, and, and guide me in the right direction. We're just coming out of Ramadan, right? Um, but many of us had to visit a provider while we were fasting, right? So we can't, we can't have, we can't be inculcated, we can't draw blood, um, and things like that. Just to be aware of the time and space of your patients, you know, and what they may be going through. Be patient. I think uh, sometimes uh, the culture and the language can be barrier. So I think maybe to be uh, more patiently and eventually they they will understand uh, each other. The Somalis are part of this American fabric right now. I mean, we're not, you know, just guests here anymore. I, I have no other place. This is home. They utilize the, the people in your community um, that look like the community you're trying to serve to foster trust uh, with the healthcare system. We're not just consumers of the system. We're also a part of the system. Yes, we are patients, but also we are also the doctors and the nurses. I have a Somali doctor, so if I need uh, if I need an appointment, I go to my Somali doctor, and I also, I also have a Somali dentist. It makes it easier for me to, to go in and out. I actually went out there and interviewed with a few different uh, providers and sat with them, and some of them were wonderful and would take these uh, appointments. This is a, a, a relationship, sometimes a lifelong relationship, and it's important for people to be comfortable with who's giving that care. Systems don't really change themselves. Uh, it's people who created it, and it's people that need to, to change those systems. We have so much to learn from the cultures of our neighbors. I hope you join me as we listen deeply to their stories and strengthen our communities together.